Hello. How's it going? It's Friday, <laughs> and we're all here together. I promise this hour, I'm gonna call it a power hour. It'll be a little less than an hour because I know you're on your lunch break and you guys are like in the middle of the work day. But I am here to jazz you up and really inspire you because I've been on my own personal journey which turned into a book called The Self-Love Experiment. So as we get started, I wanna ask you a question. And just think about this for a moment and I will ask you to share with the person next to you. So, you know, that's kind of fun, right? Get cozy. Think about someone who really inspires you. It could be a mentor, a boss, a teacher, a best friend. Maybe it's someone you don't know, a public figure, an author. Just kidding, most of you probably don't know me. So, <laughs> but no, think about someone who inspires you and what are the qualities of an empowered person, okay? So just take a quick moment workshop with each other so you can say who it is and what why they inspire you okay so we'll come back to the group does anyone want to share just all I all I want to hear is just maybe qualities of the inspiring person just shout them out self-empowered self just qualities of that empire, in, in, empowered person Determined, empowering other people, yes. Confidence, passionate, yes, these are great words. Anyone else? Qualities of the empowered person. Happy, driven, all of these. Honest, these are amazing. So these qualities are also qualities of self-love. These qualities are also qualities of an empowered person, someone who is standing in their truth. And today I'm going to help you. Yes, I'll be talking about my experiment and my experience in writing my book, but I'm here to help you stand in your truth. Because my ultimate goal is that when people ask that question, you say, I empower me. I'm empowered and inspired by me because I've worked really hard to get to where I am in my life. And I'm super excited where I'm going to go. So that's where we're going today. And so when you first hear the word self-love, what are some of the things you guys think of? We're here today at a lunch break to talk about self-love. Anybody kind of think maybe it's selfish? You don't have to raise your hand, but I hear that a lot. Narcissistic, Narcissistic a little bit selfish, a little bit, uh, right? I used to think that. I used to think that for many, many years. In fact, I was at war with myself for almost three decades. I hated myself. I hated my body. I blamed my body for everything. I didn't make the dance team in high school. It was my body's fault. A uh, man didn't call me back whenever they didn't call me back. It was always me, my body to blame. And it didn't matter what size my body was. Because I used to be a triathlete. I would run half marathons every other weekend. I would participate in half Ironman triathlons. So I looked really healthy on the outside. I looked really fit. Looked like I had it together. I haven't always been an author. I haven't always been talking to people and writing books. In fact, several years ago, all through my 20s, I was in corporate. I was in advertising. Anybody have friends in advertising? Especially here, right? And I was climbing the corporate ladder, living in Chicago, and it looked like I had it all together. I was dating a man who wanted to marry me, and I was making a lot of money, so much money I didn't even know what to do with it. Yet I was in a lot of debt, so much debt. Just wipe my sweat here. And I got to a point where I said, something's got to give, because on the outside it looked like I had everything, but on the inside I was crying myself to sleep every single night. I was suffering from eating disorders, and my doctor diagnosed me with clinical depression. So there's actually a point in my life where we can't look and judge people and say by on the outside how they look, because everyone's having their own internal experience. And so I got to a place where I said, you know what, something has to change. And my inner voice, I said, depression, why are you here? What could you possibly teach me? And my depression said, follow your heart. You're sad because you're not being true to yourself. So I got up the courage to follow my heart, which meant leaving advertising, leaving Chicago, and moving back to Portland, Oregon, where I grew up, and finding my passion for writing and speaking and leading retreats. And through this process, I started to write books. 
And I found the most joyous activity in the world. I found my life passion through writing. And when I was promoting my first book called Find Your Happy, which talks about how to be happy, I was going on tour. And I was getting ready to go on the morning television show in Seattle. And the night before, I was in the hotel room. And I was looking in the mirror. And I was crying. Because here I was going to go on TV and I was going to talk to people about how to be happy because I had been much happier than I was. I had worked through the addictions. I had overcome the depression. Here I was living my dream job, but I couldn't say one good thing about myself. I hated myself. I said, how happy can you be if you don't love yourself? And that's where the self-love experiment was born. So this was several years ago, but through the process, I started to do research. And, excuse me, <laughs> what I discovered is that 90% of women hate their bodies. Ladies, 90% of us. And I discovered that 95% of people absolutely want to change something about themselves. So just take a look at the room. Almost all of us, we have something we dislike. And it gets worse. Six out of 10 people actually opt out of important activities because of a flaw or insecurity. So this is actually controlling our life, okay? So an insecurity blocks us from showing up. And that's when I realized the self-love experiment has to happen to save my life, because I was not living my life. I was letting my insecurities hold me back, and I was preventing myself from living my potential. And that's what I offer to you today, to think about what is that problem, the flaw, the insecurity, that you feel has been stopping you from moving forward. Just take a moment. I call it the almost paradise syndrome. It's the when I lose the weight, I'll be happier. When I get the promotion, when I move to the city, I really want to be in. When I get that X, Y, Z, then maybe my life can start. But guess what? Most of the time when we get that, we realize we're still not happy. I lost all the weight. I still wasn't happy. I got that dream job. Something was missing. And so at the core of every single thing we want in our life is empowerment, self-love. So we chase it, and we look for it outside of ourselves, but really it's inside, inside of ourselves. So today I have a process I'm going to take you through. But I first want to talk a little bit about what the self-love experiment actually is and how I got to learning how to love myself fully because truly I stand here up here in front of you loving myself, every fiber of my body, even though I sweat in front of people all the time. It doesn't matter. I'm sitting on the couch and I sweat. <laughs> and so it really becomes about showing up as you are no matter where you are and letting yourself be seen. Let yourself be who you are. So what is the self-love experiment? It had three goals. Number one, I wanted to lighten up. How many of us want to lighten up, right? Spiritually, emotionally, physically, mentally, I was taking life so serious. I would go out to dinner or lunch with friends and I couldn't be present because I was so focused on how the next bite I took would put me over my calorie limit. My best friend called me and said, I'm getting married. I want you to be in the wedding. And my first thought, this is before the self-love experiment, was not, I'm so excited for you. Yes, I can't wait to be in the wedding. It was, holy crap, do I have enough time to lose the weight? And I wasn't overweight at all then. So we have these things about ourselves. And really, the war that's happening is inside our head. The inner critic is driving us. And that's why this book is out. And that's why I did the self-love experiment. So just as I take you through the process, think about where your insecurities have been blocking you. What flaw do you wake up in the morning and focus on? Because this process will reverse it. This process will let you be who you are in a world that tries to tell you to change. Because the world's going to keep saying, be smarter, richer, prettier, thinner, go chase whatever. But the real magic of the self-love experiment and also being alive is to say, guess what? I'm not going to subscribe to that anymore because that's where our anxiety comes from. It's where the depression and the addictions come from. I was able to heal my depression and my eating disorders and find my life purpose and passion by discovering self-love. So the second part and the second goal of my self-love experiment was to say only nice things about myself. Can I look in the mirror and say kind things? Yes, it's possible. 
What do you say to yourself when you look in the mirror? Let's turn it into a kind conversation. And then the third, the third goal was to see myself the way my dog does. Any dog lovers, animal lovers, cats? Do you ever notice how they see you and you're the most amazing thing in the world? <laughs> I wanted to be the coolest, most beautiful, awesome person in the world. Because they don't judge you. They love you no matter what. That's really the ultimate expression of the self-love experiment. And those goals are realized through the process. So you have to, and I had to, realize that I have to treat it like an experiment. So like a scientist, right? You go into it, you have some type of goal, but really it's the process. Each experiment that you do, each thing you try, is going to move you one step closer to possibly what it is you want. So instead of putting the expectation on each thing you do, you say, guess what? I learned from this, now I'm going to try something else. So the experiment is actually what I think we should try to do for our life. What if we looked at our life as an experiment and we took off the expectations? And we stopped saying, I have to do this to get here. I should do this. So much pressure we put on ourselves. So the experiment is super important. And I encourage you guys to look at how you can take, take your weekend, go into the weekend, and say, I'm going to make this an experiment. What am I going to do that's going to be more fun, more playful, and I'll be in the process. So about three months into my self-love experiment, I started to say, OK, this is working. I'm feeling good about myself, but not all the time. It was kind of fleeting, right? So I was at my mom's house. And you guys know the coloring books where you can color? They were really popular a few years ago. They might still be popular. And mine had a mantra on it that said, everything happens for a reason. And it had butterflies and flowers. And I didn't know that that was a universal sign right there. But I was coloring, and I was talking, and my mom and I, one of my best friends, were talking about our dreams and goals. About three months into my self-love experiment, and she started to bring up a conversation about some friends of ours that were getting married, and it triggered something in me. It didn't even matter who they were. I started to cry. A woman in her mid-30s, very successful in her career, looks again like she has happiness, which I was happy. We'll talk about that in a second, how to not chase the happiness. I was crying, and she said, why are you crying? What's the matter? She put her pencil down, and I said, Mom, do you think anyone can love me the way that I am? And that was right there, the core of my biggest limiting belief. I felt unlovable. What I was really asking, and I didn't know at the time, was do you think I can love myself the way that I am? And of course, she put her pencil down right away, and she said, Shannon, don't ever say that about yourself. Of course, the mother would never want to hear that. And the next thing she said is, was the most important thing that really kicked in the self-love experiment and changed my life forever. She said, Shannon, the most important thing is that you're happy. And if you're not happy at this body size, then maybe this isn't the size for you. Now, she meant this with so much love and compassion. And this is what we hear a lot. I grew up with this. But in that moment, I rejected that because I said, no, that's not the answer. Because for my whole life, I've tried to change myself to be happy. Whether I was 40 pounds underweight or 60, 70 pounds overweight, the problem is not outside of me. So in her saying that, I decided I'm going to stop asking everyone else. And I'm going to go inward and start to trust myself. And that was the most revolutionary thing that I could do because I was also saying, guess what? Society that says I should be smaller or I can't be happy until I have this amount of money in the bank or I'm with my soulmate, a woman who's single in her mid-30s, what's wrong with her? All these things we say to ourselves. But in that moment, I said, nope. The goal is for me to learn how to love myself as I am. And that is what the self-love experiment is. Because we all have things we want to change about ourselves. But learning how to love yourself does not have to mean you have to change yourself from a place of self-hate. It means you can take, pro take steps to move forward and be more kind and compassionate with yourself from a loving place. So that was really the key. And so it is not outside of ourselves. The answer is really on the inside. And so how did I get to here today from crying on my mom's living room and crying in the bathroom? I did a self-love experiment, and it was the most glorious thing I've ever done. As a writer, it turned into a book. I didn't know it was going to be a book when I started it. 
but this book healed me because I found self-love. I stand up here loving every single fiber of my body and showing up as I am, and that is the key for all of you, to show up through your insecurities, to show up through the things you think you need to change because you are enough as you are. So I have a process, three things that I'm gonna share with you, and then we'll kind of do a QA and a and uh, that's, that's how we'll go. So there's actually, the book is actually divided in different layers because there's layers to self-love. So I take people through a process. The first layer is self-care, okay? When you guys hear self-care, a lot of times, in the wellness industry especially, we hear, drink your green juice, do your yoga, go to Soul Cycle, which is really fun, by the way, I just did it. <laughs> so we get so wrapped up in having to be and do a certain, we stay in this box, right? The wellness community and just being, taking care of yourself. I got to a point where I realized I am sick of yoga. I don't want any more 30-day hot challenge yoga challenges. I'm done with it. I don't want any more kale salad. <laughs> and I said, what does self-care really mean? And I discovered it's about joy. What brings you joy? And that is why also when I said a lot of us are chasing happiness, we never really get there because happiness is, an, is a feeling. It's something that will elude us Whereas joy is an experience. It's a, it's a process, but it's a way of living. So I truly believe that joy is the best barometer for success in any layer, in any level of your life. Whether it's a relationship, whether it's a career, whether it's trying to reach your goal of losing weight or going on your dream vacation, joy. So how can you put more joy into your life right now? So I started to do that and I realized I wanted more nature walks with my dog. I wanted to join a spinning studio instead of to do in the yoga. And so I started to fill myself up. I started to cook more. I started to do things that felt good and made me feel alive. So ask yourself what makes you feel alive. That's the most caring thing you can do for yourself. If you love camping, get out and go camping. If you love animals, go adopt a pet. You know, there's things we can do to bring more joy into our life right now. So that's one part of the process, but I'm gonna share three of the principles that really stand out that I think can help you guys in your own life as well. And at the back of the book, there's 15 principles, so I'm pulling out the highlighted ones. So I think we have to first ask ourselves, how do you know when you're lacking self-love? Because I didn't know that I didn't love myself. I just knew that my experience of life was difficult. A lot of times we don't walk around saying, I don't love myself. It's in our actions, it's in our behavior. It's in the way we're always trying for something more than what is. And so anybody wonder, like throw out, why do you think, wh what would be an example of when we don't love ourselves? Rejection, yeah, when we feel rejection, so good. One of the main ones is when we compare ourselves to other people. And I, get, I bet if we get really honest with ourselves, we've probably compared ourselves to someone else within the past three or four days, right? Especially at work. And then also when we compare ourselves to ourself. You may have had a different version of you five years ago, a skinnier you, one who was in a different job or one who was in a different relationship. You're like, man, if only I could go back or maybe not go back, but what happened? Or we look to the future part of us and we're like, gosh, that person out there, I'm not there yet. And I'm not in the body I want or the career I want, whatever it may be. So we compare ourselves to other people, but we also compare ourselves to ourselves and this is detrimental, but it's part of being human. You cannot get out of it. And so I'm gonna share a process with you to help you if you fall into comparison. Because judgment and comparison keeps us from love. Judging is a form of fear. It's a form of lack that I'm not enough and what that person has is better and they're deserving and I'm not. And we go into this cycle where we spin out of control. Now the trick and the goal with the self-love experiment is to give you guys tools, lots of tools to help you feel empowered in your life. And one of the tools is to work through judgment. And I actually have a three-part process that I'll share with you right now. Number one is to recognize when you're comparing yourself to other people, they are just showing you what is possible. So for example, I'm a book author. I have a book, obviously, that just came out. But in September, there's amazing books coming out too from some of my favorite authors who have been writing for much longer. M amazing people. 
and their books are already like number one, and then they haven't even come out. So my, my mind is like, oh my gosh, I just wrote this book, and these people have a book coming out in a month, what's happening? They're doing better, and I fall into, oh. Now before my self-love experiment, I would have carried that energy all through my tour. I would have, you know, showed up and been like, go, gone to bed each night feeling not enough, right? But the self-love experiment gave me the process of saying, oh, yes, they're showing me what's possible. Thank you. I can have that. Because if we didn't compare ourselves, there's so many things going on in the world. We don't compare ourselves to everyone. The ones we compare ourselves to are usually the ones that show us something within us that we want, which means it's already within us to have. It's just about becoming who you need to be to get to where you, to, to receive that. And so to recognize, thank you. You're showing me what's possible. I see this can be an option for my life if I want it. And then number two is to immediately go into appreciation. Appreciation for your own life. So I turned my attention right away to, oh my gosh, I just, I wrote a book. And I get to go travel all over the country and I get to just celebrate self-love, how awesome. Also, celebrate the people who are showing up for you. Appreciate the things that are going well in your life because if we keep focusing on what's not going well, we stay stuck, we stay in lack. So I want you to take a moment right now to just think about what you are appreciative of and give thanks, just for a moment. I won't ask you to share this time. So this practice of appreciation is one of the best and fastest ways to move forward. I helped heal my depression when I was in corporate, hating my job, hating my life, by first, very first step, turning to appreciation. So if we ever feel trapped by life circumstances and victimized by the world, then we can go to what can I be appreciative of? What can I be thankful for right now? And then from that place, you can step forward. It's a much more loving energy. So I did the same thing with the things I hated about myself. How can I appreciate my overweight belly or my chin or all of the things that we say we don't like about ourselves? And if you can't get there, then focus on the things you do appreciate about yourself. You might love your nose or your hair or the way you're positive and happy or the way you're trying to be positive and show up for yourself one step at a time. So it's about one step at a time, which is the process and the experiment. And then the third, if you're in comparison, is to stand by you. What I mean by this is to give yourself what it is you really need and want. So in this experience of comparing myself to other authors, I recognized what I really wanted, which was appreciation. I had a book come out. I wanted recognition. I wanted love. So the magic is to give that to yourself. Here I was, right before I started my book tour, seeing all these other authors trending all over on the New York Times list, all this stuff. And I said, wow, I haven't even given myself appreciation. I haven't even shown myself love because I've been so busy the past couple weeks. So give yourself what it is you need, and all of a sudden you will feel more empowered. What I needed was recognition. So I said, Shannon, you wrote a book. I hadn't told myself that at all. So what can you recognize yourself for? What can you celebrate yourself for? What can you lift yourself up for? One step at a time starts up here. And then the very next day, my agent talked to me and I looked at the numbers and I saw that my book, The Self-Love Experiment, was trending on Amazon, number one in self-esteem. And I say this only because I believe this process works. When you show up for yourself and get out of what's going on out there, and return to inside, you're an empowered person moving forward. You have the power to control the outcome by being in the space of love and compassion for yourself. And so the second one, actually there's a principle I'll share with you for this. The, it's number one, the principle number one is to accept where you are. It's just a point in your journey and everything about, the, everything about it offers possibility for growth and expansion. So when it looks like comparing yourself to others, recognize where you are, accept it, and then from that place you can move forward, and that place you'll feel more charged up. So what can you accept in your life right now? There's that famous Chinese proverb, accept what you can't change, change what you can't accept. It really does start with acceptance. Okay, so the second one I'll share with you today, 
This is the barrier that blocks us and when we know we're out of self-love. It's when we feel hopeless or we feel like self-love is selfish or we feel like, how dare I care about myself? So here's the thing, there's so much going on in the world right now. Disasters, political uproar, there's a lot of fear, terrorists, like it's crazy out there. And we can easily fall into feeling depressed and feeling hopeless. And I did this about two months before my book was coming out. There was so much. I was watching the news every day, which I suggest you don't do. It was crazy. <laughs> I know we're in New York, but like, ah, it was crazy. And I said, how, who am I to go talk about self-love? I have a book about loving yourself. How, how dare anyone focus on them when there's the world that needs saving? And I caught myself right away because I said, something that actually helped me in my own self-love experiment is that suddenly it made sense. To stop hating myself is to raise the vibration on the planet. To stop being negative to myself is to actually do my part to uplift the entire world because that's one less person hurting, that's one less person in pain, and that's one less person stuck in negativity. So we owe it to ourselves to show up for ourselves because from that place we can do so much more good. We can give more time, more energy, more love to those who need it. And that was a revolutionary change for me. And it turned into a principle in the self-love experiment, which is when you heal yourself, you help to heal the world. You can make the most profound difference in the world by focusing on yourself first, to forgive yourself, to honor yourself, and love yourself. From that place, you make really empowered choices. Guess what? Hurt people hurt people. People who are in pain affect other people. When I was depressed, I wanted to help people. I started my life coaching practice. And it's hard to show up fully when you're stuck in your stuckness. You just can't. We do it because we have big hearts. All of us in here have huge hearts. You wouldn't be in a self-love experiment lunch if you didn't have a big heart. And so we show up and we say, you know what? I want to be even more empowered. And we do that by first being kind and compassionate to ourselves. So I want to invite you guys to ask yourself, where have you been blowing yourself off? Where have you been saying, this, de this deserves more attention? I'm not going to show up for me this is more important, I will skip that thing that is really important to me. My dreams don't matter, I'll just wait. Just ask yourself and maybe go into the weekend thinking about how can I show up for myself more? How can I be more present in my life and put more love into the equation right now? So I'm gonna move into the third reason a lot of us actually do not feel self-love without even realizing it. Anyone wanna guess? No guesses, I'll just share self-doubt and fear, right? When we're in self-doubt, and what this looks like is we believe our insecurities are real. We believe the problems about us are actually the problem. So Tony Robbins, you guys know Tony Robbins, America's life coach, huge motivational speaker. <laughs> That's what he calls himself. <laughs> he says problems need energy to grow. If you do not give your problems energy, then guess what, they won't, they won't manifest bigger and take up so much time and space in our life. What problem are you focusing on? Now, there's a difference between a problem that you look for the solution, right? In your work, especially with what you guys do here, there's a part of showing up, but going immediately to the solution is the key, instead of festering in the problem and letting it overcome you. So the problems that we have in our life the insecurities we have, the fears we have, often look like self-doubt. I don't feel good enough, I don't feel worthy enough. For me, I didn't feel lovable. And so ask yourself what self-doubt in your life is blocking you from moving forward. So self-doubt, here's the thing about it. It shows up in every layer of our life. So I am up here and I truly do love myself and I'm excited about the possibilities. But self-doubt a couple weeks ago before I left for my tour, came roaring in a lot of what was going on in the world, right? And I sat there for a moment. I said, what's going on? This is like crippling self-doubt. 
And for a couple minutes, I sat there. Before my self-love experiment, I would have let it control my outcome. I may have even canceled some events. I may have just like hidden in my bed and covered up or eaten lots of ice cream. Like all these things we do, overwork, overspend, overeat, over exercise. We over the situation. I invite you guys to feel what comes up. So I sat there with my self-doubt. And I'm going to invite you guys to do this too. Put your hand on your heart. If you want the right hand, anytime you feel self-doubt, just return to yourself in the moment. Put your hand here and you say, hello. Hello, you, right? And you can say, what are you here to show me? The same, the same way that I asked my depression, what are you here to show me? And my self-doubt came through. And it said, are you sure? Are you sure you don't want to stay small? because self-doubt wants us to stay small. Fear and our negative voice wants us to retreat back to what is comfortable and what we know. It's predictable, it's manageable, it's something we know. Whereas anytime you're growing, anytime you're dreaming, and anytime you're stepping into the next level of your life, your self-doubt will get louder. And I said, in that moment with my hand on my heart, Quickly, it said, are you sure you want to stay small? And my heart roared through and said, are you kidding? You were born for this. Every single one of you was born for this, to work through that self-doubt, to step forward and be empowered and choose you. Your life is your masterpiece. We hear this, right? We hear this, but I want you to really feel this. Anytime you fall into fear, insecurity, self, lack of self-worth, or I'm not good enough, or gosh, that person has what I want, return to right here. Put your hand on your heart. Say, I love me, or I'm doing the best I can each day, and that is enough. One step at a time, we can get there. And so what I offer to you guys with this principle, this self-love experiment principle number three, is we get what we focus on. So are you focusing on how it's not going to work, how everything you've tried before is not moving forward? Then that's going to keep creating what we want. Are you focusing on the problem? It's growing. Take your attention off of it and focus on what you truly want, love, empowerment, acceptance, and you'll start to see the results in your life much more clear. So I'm going to offer to you guys, as we close out the little speech here, my wish for you is that next time someone asks you who empowers you, you immediately say, you know what? I'm empowered by me. And I'm, I'm not shy from that, and I'm not unapologetic, because you guys are amazing. You work really hard, and you show up every day, and you're doing the best you can. So start telling yourself that. Start to really feel that, because that's how we can move and help and change the world. I believe that. So I welcome you and invite you to dive into the self-love experiment. That's it. <laughs> yeah. I like it, she's like, oh. That was fantastic, Shannon. Thank you so much for being here. Like, what a great speech, what a great book, by the way. If you guys haven't read it, do yourself a favor. Um, you talk a lot about the inner critic. Um, I think that we can all relate, especially being here. Um, we're very much sometimes under a lot of pressure, and there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of production. I think that needs to happen. Um, and you also talk a little bit about how inner, inner credit, especially for you, led to a lot of self sabotage and, and, and so on and so forth. How how do you think that we, just in general as a culture, or even yourself, lead or just sort of uh, experience self-sabotage and how does that come through in our lives? Totally. I think, yeah, so self-sabotage happens in so many ways, yeah. right? It happens by us shying away from what we really want, right? Like like I've mentioned a couple times, I'm just a sweaty person. Like yeah. I could not, I could have chosen not to be a public speaker, <laughs> right? But I'm so passionate about my message that I let that, I, I it just, it is what it is. So you get to a point where you accept what is and when we shy away from what it is we really want, because of a part of us that we feel isn't good enough, it's really us not honoring or living our potential. And so it also looks like overspending, like I said, overeating, over, over anything, because a lot of times we're afraid to feel the, what's really there. So I would ask also sometimes when we wake up in the morning, what do you say to yourself about yourself? If you don't do as good in the meeting, 
or if you don't, you know, you go home and you didn't get everything on your list done. How are you talking to yourself? I think it does come back to being a friend to yourself first and foremost, and that's how we can step forward. Excellent. Yeah. You state, uh, and I'm going to read a quote from the book, learning how to love me has been the most difficult thing I've ever had to do. Uh, not because loving yourself is particularly hard, but because I had to unlearn all the things I was conditioned to believe about self-love. I think it goes back to what you were saying earlier about narcissism or sort of that Absolutely. label sometimes when you think that self-love is sort of um, right. a little bit self-righteous. How are those green, uh, how are those beliefs sort of ingrained uh, and, and how does that reflect on what self-love or self-care self means for us? Right, and I think that's key. Um, it's like so many of us are kind of like chasing the, let me see the, the, yeah, this the one, quote. right? Yeah. So in the, we're, we're chasing this feeling, right? And that's really what I was talking about in the book. Learning how to love myself was hard because if your parents didn't love yourself, they did the best they could, right? If society and the media is always telling us to change ourselves, everyone's just doing what they know how to do. Mm. But I had to unlearn all of that. From a very young age, we're taught we have to look a certain way, be a certain way, talk a certain way, right, in our family or in society. And so self-love is often about being who you are as you are. And that is the most, self-love is freedom. Mm -hmm. What we're chasing, what we really want is freedom. In that happiness, in that paradise, in that job, in that more money, in that soulmate relationship, what we really want is to be seen for who we are. Mm -hmm. So for me personally, I was so much of my life, I was trying to be seen. I was like looking, I was like, you know, comparing myself, see me, see me, but I wasn't seeing myself. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to really allow ourselves to be honest about who we are and celebrate who we are. Excellent. Yeah. Um, do you regret your earlier life of a drug addiction or eating disorders or depression? It's kind of a That's heavy a good question. question. It's a heavy question. It's but a good question for a work environment, <laughs> but you know, it's Hello. Friday. <laughs> Uh, I don't regret any phase of my life at all. In fact, I'm so thankful for it. While I was in it, it was very hard and very depressing and dark. But I think we all have phases in our life that are hard, depressing, and dark. And when we can be aware while we're in it, say that this is part of maybe something bigger. Because mm -hmm. looking back, I wouldn't be able to write a book about self-love if I didn't hate myself. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to do what I love if I didn't experience those. So I think it's really about allowing yourself to go through each phase of life. Yeah. Does anybody want to ask any questions from the audience? Q&A time about anything in the world. Anything. <laughs> what are your plans for the weekend? Yeah. How are you doing, Joy? Yeah. Oh. Hi, my name is Pankaj Makati. Thank you so much for sharing your self-love experience. So the question is, uh, you said uh, accept uh, yourself as you are. But uh, to improve in anything you do or as a person, you need to constantly analyze yourself or act your own critique. Yes. That yeah. How do you improve? So how do you balance both the things? That's such a great question. I'm so glad you asked that because I think what, the, what we have to ask ourselves is where is our point of attraction? So from before, I was like trying to reach that number on the scale or we're trying to improve ourselves from a place of self-hate or desperation or I'm not good enough. But once I found self-love and when you're in an empowered place, that means you can make the changes from an empowered place. It doesn't mean we just settle. It doesn't mean we just say, oh, forget it. I'm healthier and happier than I've ever been today and making the best choices for me, even though society may say an overweight person you know, doesn't, isn't that way. So for you and anyone who's trying to improve, it's about saying, I'm gonna do this because I love myself and I care about myself and I'm gonna honor myself. And then watch, your results come a lot faster. So in essence, what you're saying is, uh Anything that you do should be inner driven and not external driven. Somebody else shouldn't Absolutely. be uh, telling you. So that yeah, and yeah. I get that we have bosses that need stuff from us, right? So yeah. <laughs> you guys all walk out, you're like, shit, it says that we don't have to. No. <laughs> don't do that. No, but I, I believe that the internal, the reason we feel this anxiety and this pain and we go home feeling like something's missing is because we're still looking out there. Once we turn inward, and there's a process I take people through in the book to really align, then yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Okay. Thank yeah, you. thank you for the question. I feel like we should clap. This is like <laughs> <laughs> Just for standing up, that takes courage. Any other questions? Um, hello. Hi. Thank you. You did great. Thank you. <laughs> um, so my question is, um, as a child, like what 
what did you see around you that made you start to um, lack that confidence, right? Like, what were the reinforcements in your life, if it's not too personal? No, it's not. I think that sometimes we pick up things as children. I know you talked a little bit about, like, rejection from the basketball team, but, like, at home, like, right. where, where was your family not um, encouraging you, your siblings, your aunts, your uncles? And I ask that because I know that that's been, like, an experience for me where it's, like, I, don't, I didn't get that love reinforcement at home. Right. And then I found out later, well, like, the last few years, it dawned on me, like, yeah, my mom didn't have it. Her parents weren't around. Yeah, my aunt didn't have it. Her parents weren't around. You know, so what, was that I think it's a beautiful question. Saw? Absolutely, yeah. and actually, in the book, I talk about it. <laughs> yeah, if you want, I talk about it too because there's a principle in the book. In order to find self love, we have to be who we needed to be when we were younger. Because for all of us, I'm going to answer this in a layered way. If we get really clear and honest with ourselves from age like maybe seven to nine, usually something happens, something happens in every person's life where we are ourself, we do what we feel is natural, but the world tells us that's wrong. So for me, I really love ice cream. I loved it as a kid. It was fun. And it was part of how I related to my dad because he loves sweet stuff. But my mom would say, no, don't eat the ice cream, like really bad. And so I saw the way she looked at me. I saw the way she treated me when I did what felt natural. Like I'm just talking about food, but there's other situations in our life. Um, and I shied away. So it turned into an eating disorder at a very young age where I'd have to hide something that felt natural. Now, if she would have said, okay, maybe you can have a, a couple bites or something, then maybe it wouldn't have turned into me feeling bad about doing what I want. So instead of blaming our parents, right, they did the best they could, we as adults still feel like there's a piece of us. Now, there could, maybe it wasn't eating for you, but maybe you wanted to be a dancer and your parents wanted you to be an athlete. Or maybe you want to be an artist, like the, all these things that we shy away from. So the point is, as an adult, give yourself what you needed as a child that was missing. And there's a process I take you through in the book as well, which is really healing. Because I realized I had a great childhood, very loving, but I was bullied because I was the new kid all the time and I would eat and, you know, overweight child. So wherever you were, go back to your childhood. Go back to that point where you first realized, oh my gosh, I was just being me and the world said I got made fun of for being me. Or, you know, and then give yourself as an adult that love, that respect and attention. And then forgive your parents because they do the best they can and they don't even know better. And we can do better for us. Thank you. Good question. Did that answer it? Thank you. Any can other you, questions? Can you, can you give a bad answer? <laughs> <laughs> I can try. <laughs> Um, I, I just have one, one more question. Um, you talk a lot about the tools, and I love that you actually just added more tools onto what you already talked about. Yeah. What are your favorite tools when it comes to self-love or self-care? Yeah, that's beautiful. So I like the hand on the heart, which I, I shared with you guys. Mm -hmm. But actually, one of the beautiful things about the book is I am really big believer on asking yourself questions and then giving your yourself time to answer. So I've put all the questions I asked in the book in the back in like a format so you could do a joy journal or free write on it. Mm -hmm. But one of my favorite favorites is letters to yourself. So letters to your future self. When I was stuck in depression, I had no idea that there was such thing as a happy life, someone who enjoyed their career. And I was like, dear future Shannon, what message do you have for me? And so I encourage you guys to, the one who has it figured out, the one who's not suffering. And then there's also a letter to your past self. So now I write a letter to the one who was depressed and stuck and like, oh, it's going to work out. Just stay with it. Like, don't give up. Or the most challenging one is letter to the part of you that is struggling. So I said, dear overweight body, why are you here? What do you have to teach me? And it said, you are here to love yourself no matter what. I'm here to show you that how you look. Self-love is not how you look. It's about how you live. So we can get profound answers when we just allow ourselves the space and time to go inward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Do you, ever, do you ever mail the letters to yourself? I should, but yeah. I haven't yet. That would be really fun. I, did a, I have crazy journals piled up all over. So I did a, I did a, something similar a few years ago when I was a yoga teacher, and I had a whole class write letters to the future selves. That's so and fun. And they gave them to me, and I held on to them for two years, and then I ended up sending them Letters. That's so it's, special. I, it's fantastic. You guys it's should all great. go home today, write a letter, and then mail it to yourself. Yeah, or give it to <laughs> someone it to that you trust and then have them mail it to you. It's at a really later fun. Time. It's actually fantastic. And it's about celebrating you and saying, yeah. you know what? Start start saying, like, you're doing a good job. I appreciate you. Yeah. Like, we did good today. Like, we need to be our own cheerleaders. I love it. 
Any last questions from the audience? Yes, come on up. Hi. Um, I guess my question is regarding, or if you touch on the book at all, on external love and when that, I guess, came back into lo your life or um, where you feel like that balance comes. Yeah, okay. actually, that's beautiful. Um, so a lot of the work that I do is about learning how to be your own hero. A lot of the, you're talking about like maybe romantic yeah. love. So for me, yes. So there is a part in there, and there's it's it's actually layered throughout. Um, I don't have one specific tool, but I will say that it's conducive on when you truly love yourself, you can bring the love into your life that is really long lasting and who loves themselves too. So I also think that every relationship we're in at every stage of our life is an opportunity and a teacher and a lesson. So every relationship leading up to the soulmate has become a profound kind of helping me become more of who I need to be. And I think for all of us as well. But it is very much, you come to relationships from a place of not needing them to fill you up, whereas you are full and saying, I accept myself and love myself and you are adding to my life and we are in this glorious adventure together, which is a beautiful place to be. Yeah. I have a lot of articles too on that. Like I write for Huffington Post and Mind Body Green, so just type in, relationship Shannon Kaiser it might come up <laughs> yeah all right can we get a big round of applause for Shannon please? thank you thank you